so much for joining us today, Catherine. Thank you, Rebecca. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited um, to talk to you today. Um, really, because this message is something I think parents need to hear. So um, let's start our conversation and just talk a little bit about what is holistic orthodontics and facial harmony? So we can kind of get an understanding of you know how this is different from what we know as traditional orthodontics. Thank you, because uh, the word holistic, I chose it for many reasons to kind of set myself apart. And I realized when I chose the word holistic, it can come with lots of different ideas that parents might have, mm -hmm. as well as other providers. So first, let's just address that some people might think <laughs> holistic orthodontics means that they don't need to have any actual orthodontics done. They don't have to have any appliances, that there's some other alternative method for straightening teeth that they don't actually have to involve me. Um, and I can help support that idea, but if they come to me, I'm going to talk to them how I can help grow their jaws. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a magic wand yet. Right. <laughs> so just yet. help move everything. Um, <laughs> So that's one of the things because some parents have come in like, oh, well, I thought you were holistic. So I wouldn't actually have to do any actual appliances or anything. Mm -hmm. But if you want me to help grow your jaws for me, that's my modality. And I can help support others that can then help further growth, such as cranial sacral therapy, things like that. And by the way, I love that you're saying grow the jaw. It's not just about straightening the teeth. Right. Yeah. So that's <laughs> we'll get to that, too. Um, so thank you. The other thing is some, some people think then it's just, I incorporate essential oils or that it's some kind of weird voodoo that I do. Uh, I will say I support those oilers out there. I don't incorporate that into my practice because I, I don't have a strong enough knowledge base, but I support anyone that they feel that is helping their child, such mm -hmm. as different people use diffusers, things like that. Right. I'm aware enough to know that that can be very beneficial. It's just not part of my practice. Okay. And there's no voodoo. Everything that I do is scientifically based. Right. I just choose the word holistic because it really resonated with the patients I wanted to help. Those that okay. understood, I am not going to be looking at the teeth primarily. On my list of checks of what I look for uh, on my patients, the teeth come in maybe like the lower third part of my checklist, okay? And that shift alone, I want to help the patients and parents that are going to be like, oh, that's okay that you're talking about the teeth last because that's not mm -hmm. for everyone yet. Right, right, yet. <laughs> yet. And... I understand there's others that use airway centric or airway for me and where I was starting out in a town outside of Chicago, but it's a suburb in Indiana airway. What did that mean to them? Right. Airway and orthodontics didn't seem to go together. You know, there's some things that go together like peanut butter and jelly, but airway and orthodontics, that was so much of a barrier because it, what, what did that even mean? Right now, right. all these years later, it's much more of a topic, right? But when I started out, that wasn't something that would resonate with those I was trying to help. So holistic is actually patient centered care. So I'm looking at the entire patient and what the patient needs and not just focusing on, okay, you came in here with this chief complaint. So I'm only going to address this chief complaint and not look at the rest of either your child or yourself, which was the modality before. You came with a chief complaint. I addressed your chief complaint. You were happy if I did well. You weren't happy if I didn't. Okay. And the word holistic then actually gives me room to better like support a community that also wants to track those same type of patients. So it opened me and my patients up to a whole new community that I didn't even realize was in my own area. So what I also like to share is that there are some practitioners 
that are holistic that don't advertise as being holistic. Because it's not a new thing. It's not a trendy thing. It's really just letting the the caregivers, the parents, the patient know, hey, you can come in here, share with me what is bringing your concern, but crooked teeth are really just a symptom of an underlying cause. And right. most often that underlying cause is mouth breathing and mouth breathing is really just a symptom of many other <laughs> underlying causes. And everything can be brought back to the oral health. Everything can be brought back to the story of the teeth. And I'm going to look at all of this and how I can help address your chief complaint, but also let you know if crooked teeth is your only chief complaint and you don't want to discuss this other stuff, there are many other people that can help you. Right. Right. And you know, what's interesting. And you mentioned that it's not, this isn't a new concept, but it's just not the normal concept. Let's look at the root cause. Let's look at everything. Mm -hmm. and go to the root cause and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here but we it just as somebody who has spent so many years in this medical realm mm -hmm. being, you know as a patient so often it's you know here's a pill here's a pill here's and we just move along you know where did this come at what point did we go off course and where we don't look at the root cause, what's causing all this? Because otherwise you're just going to have a patient back and back and mm -hmm. back. Well, this is actually where, and I might be rubbing some people the wrong way with this. It's two-sided. Okay. Okay. It's part of what us, the patient, because I'm also a patient. I've had similar stories where then we didn't get to the root cause. I was just giving a med that then mm -hmm. caused more problems that then cause me to right. be on other meds. <laughs> exactly. Right. But also I understand that where I was, I went in and I'm like, this needs to be fixed. Fix me. Okay. So now I've gone through and I've had to own that that is what I asked. And that is what the physician gave me. That's fair enough. Yeah. And especially in my specialty of orthodontics, the patient wants it painless, right? We all want things to be as painless as possible. Sure. We all want things to be as easy <laughs> as possible and as fast as possible. And that's where the biggest thing comes in, where there's a whole other discussion about the demand of the six month smiles. If you're aware of that, treating just the, you know, aesthetic six teeth, all of that was driven though, by what the patient was asking for, mm -hmm. right? right? So we need to remind ourselves as the patient, what did we ask of them? Now we also have to understand, we didn't always know that we could ask for more. And that's why CAF was created so that we could let um, right. patients and parents know you can ask for more. You are deserving a feeling good every day exactly. but how many companies profit off of, off of us feeling good every day right so many companies profit off of us not only being codependent on others for feeling good but our coffee for feeling good <laughs> our clothing for making us have a status symbol there's a mm -hmm. lot of revenue generation off of us not being empowered. And mm. now there is enough upset when, when it affects ourselves, it's one thing, but when it affects our child, yeah, that's where the earth shakes because then we're like, no, I've allowed this to happen to me, but I'm not going to allow this to happen to my child. So I'm so appreciative that this organization has been started and continues to grow so much because it is the parents and it's not fair. Okay. There's a lot of things that might not be fair, but that's how it is. They're the ones that are requesting the change for care. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there's, there's so many things in this question that I'm answering that maybe are out of order. No, no, it's great. It's great. Um, and this goes my, right along what we say all the time to these airway mamas. 
Mm -hmm. that's driving this change. Yes. And it's, I'm, I'm here because I'm that airway mama. Uh, I had already started looking into like, okay, why is this happening? And it wasn't until my own son. And I just this morning, uh, he was asking certain things. And I told him a, a brief story again of like, you know, I owe it to my son that he was the tipping point for me to actually become the best version of me because I didn't take enough. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I would say I didn't have enough confidence in asking for what I really wanted and deserved from mm. my health, from many things. Cause I'm like, Oh, well, I probably don't deserve that. Or, Oh, I'm going to be a bother. Or that's going to take up too much time. Right. Right. We've all done that. Or I'm complaining. Yes. I'm complaining. Oh, I should just listen to the doctor. And then my son, I was at that point of, well, I could just listen to everybody. Everybody's just telling me. Now, okay. Some people will be out there say, I'm not buddy. Okay. Majority of people around me are like, why don't you just listen to the doctor? Why don't the doctor says everything's fine. But I was at this fork in the road where I could just say, okay, yeah, it, the doctor, the doctor, the doctor, I'm just going to follow what the doctor says. Or I could address that little eating away part of me. That's like, you know, better, you know, better, you know, better listen, listen, listen. Um, so not to get <laughs> on that tangent, but to that, it brings us back to, uh, orthodontics. Okay. So that's, that's where I realized, oh, goodness, I, I get to change how I care for my patients. Mm -hmm. And with my specialty, my specialty sometimes gets really hit hard, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> how dare they have done this and the headgear and the teeth pulling. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just say that the majority of healthcare providers out there, because I'm sure there's, there's all, you can't always say always or never, right. They went into this because they wanted to serve others. Mm -hmm. They did the best they could. And what they were taught. With what they were taught and what they were asked for. Mm -hmm. Any patient that comes in at 12 years old got missed by so many other providers that saw that child, that patient before the orthodontist at 12 years old saw them. Yeah. And this also goes back to something we say all the time. Usually we say it for the parents, but just to be fair, it goes to our, our clinicians audience as well. You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. They weren't taught this. We hear this so often mm -hmm. from medical providers on our show. They weren't taught this. So how would they know? You know, so we're all parents and providers rowing yeah. in the same direction, trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. And when you don't know what you don't know, and you're being asked, you're being asked to look at the teeth. You're being asked to fix these as fast as possible with as little pain as possible with as few visits as possible. And then you get into your zone of, okay, patients are happy. Patients are happy. Patients are happy. And you keep going down that road. Now, this is where I can also say my profession, there are many that they want to not see this because once you see the difference in treatment planning your patient based off of crooked teeth are a symptom versus mm. crooked teeth are the problem. Mm -hmm. And you can see the dramatic shifts in the care for that patient. Mm -hmm. You can't unsee it. Nope, you can't. So what do they do? They throw doubt on, no, there's no way that that can be true. You need more research because what does research do? It gives it time. Oh, you got to have X number of randomized control studies, which randomized. Right. We're not going to do this in children, right? No. I don't think so. <laughs> That, but then they say, well, that's the highest. Yes, but that's not ethical. That's not fair. So it buys that like, oh, I have time. I have time. I don't have to look at this. I don't have to acknowledge this aspect of care because it's not validated. 
enough because it is validated. It is validated. And arguably, I've read many journal articles, many textbooks, many years of study. You simply go back to your anatomy book and physiology of how we are supposed to function. And are you going to make me do a research project on the anatomy of what proper anatomy is supposed to be? We're taught proper anatomy. How many times do you see proper anatomy in your patients? I ask them. How often? Mm. And then why? Why? Just tell me, just start the question of why. But a lot of people, they don't want that why because it makes it makes the job harder. Right. It makes the timing harder. It makes it more work for the patient because they can't just be dropped off here, drop off my kid. I'm going to pick him up in 20 minutes. Okay. And then I'll come back in six weeks. And I don't want to do anything other than making sure that the child brushes mm-hmm. because that's not patient centered care. That's drop off, pick up. I'm not going to worry because I'm going to put it all on the practitioner. Yeah. That's just putting a fix on it too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and it's also not addressing the other part of your question was facial harmony. Mm-hmm. which to have that truly stunning smile when you like everyone will think of like when you think of it, someone that has a truly stunning smile, whoever that might Jul- be. Julia Roberts. Yes, every time. Right? Yeah. But everything's connected. She's got wonderful symmetry, right? She's using her muscles evenly. Everything works well together. Those that have straight teeth, but not a great smile, which Think about it for a second. Let that yeah, picture come to mm-hmm. let the picture come to your mind. You're like, oh, and then you might see that they have poor posture. They might always be leaning to one side. But <laughs> if you look at me, I I'm I am still I'm a recovering mouth breather. <laughs> so I am a recovering facial disharmony. Okay. When you can get everything working together and you have facial harmony, where all of the muscles are supporting. So your tongue posture, your tongue is up at the roof of the mouth. Your lips want to go together without struggle. You can breathe through your nose. Now that is not only a stunning smile, but a stunning face. Mm -hmm. It is a stunning face. And as we've discovered the mental implications that come with it as well, Mm -hmm. you're going to see not everybody, but overall, signs and symptoms of ADHD go away, anxiety Mm -hmm. drops, depression comes more in line. And you see mental changes as well in these patients. Well, one thing we all have in common, anyone listening to this, anyone that's here, we're all breathing, but we don't all breathe correctly. Right. And that's just not a topic that is in most parental groups. That's not a topic that's brought up in medical groups of what's going on with my patient. They might look at oxygen saturation, but they're not looking at how the patient is breathing because Mm -hmm. they're obviously breathing. Otherwise they wouldn't be in your clinic, but that we can breathe incorrectly. And we take the simplest thing sometimes and think, oh, well, I'm not going to think about that because obviously they are doing it. But we also can understand that you can walk incorrectly, right? We talk about toe walking and walking Mm -hmm. is discussed. Mm -hmm. We can eat incorrectly. We talk about messy eating. So the discussion of breathing incorrectly seems so simple, yet it is complex. And -hmm. it is something that we are not trained well enough. So any time that we're not trained very well, oh, well, I'm supposed to be the expert. And I'm not the expert at this. So we're going to send this to somebody else, or we're just not going to talk about it. We're going to punt it down. And then you realize that there are so many people that disagree (laughs) on breathing, like um, Mm -hmm. exhaling through the mouth. If you're trying to um, relax, I was being tested, gosh, two years ago for my N95 mask. I was a part-time faculty member. And so he put the whole hood thing on me and he's like, now take a deep breath in. So I did like this. And for those that can watch, you can see my shoulders didn't rise. And he's like, no, you need to take a deep breath. I'm like, I did like, look at my belly. 
Right. Like, no, you need to take a deep breath. And like, was getting really upset at me. And I said, well, I will do that with the understanding that that's not a deep breath. If you require me to do that, but that's not a deep diaphragmatic breath. And he's like, just breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, so this guy whose whole job is to test how well I breathe with my N95 That's not the mask, right way to do it. Mm-hmm. Argued with me in front of my students that I didn't know how to take a deep breath. Mm-hmm. And that's his job. That's just so even in that arena, they have arguments about what a deep breath should be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we run into that on this the podcast all that we just hear stories Mm -hmm. it's it's crazy when it comes down to how which one makes you feel better okay which one makes you feel better Mm. let's start with that because your body's not going to lie to you right and if you haven't tried it try it sit somewhere Mm -hmm. quietly get still take breaths like normal and then go watch a patrick McCune video (laughs) and see how to breathe from the diaphragm and try that and i will tell you I'll be shocked if you don't, but you'll just feel pressure and everything just kind of, your whole body relaxes. Mm-hmm. And if you it feel anxiety, life changing. if you feel anxiety, that means your nose needs to be cleared. And so let's watch Patrick McCune's video of how there's two different ways to declog mm-hmm. the nose. And if you can't do that, then let's get you help. If trying to breathe that way is causing you anxiety, there could be a nasal obstruction. You could mm-hmm. also, though, have some actually like PTSD that needs to be observed. Address. There could be mm-hmm. trauma that you don't even realize that's causing you anxiety to breathe. And so let's let's get your help. So going back to what holistic orthodontics is, is that it will also say there are many people that say, oh, you can start at this age, you can start at this age. But a reminder that just because you can start at that age, Sometimes those patients aren't ready. And first you get to deal with what is what is really agitating their system the most. And sometimes these kids don't know how to be calm. They mm-hmm. haven't observed it in their house. They haven't observed people in their house nasal breathing or sitting there and being quiet. Mm-hmm. Or if they sit there in school and be quiet, sometimes that's not rewarded. Right. Sometimes they have to always be so active. And now I'm expecting a child to sit in my chair and I'm going to oftentimes invade the only way that they've known how to breathe. I'm going to go into their mouth. (laughs) Uh, There are problems. And in the past, there used to be different techniques. Uh, Either the parent would try to um, overpower their child Mm -hmm. through fear or shame. Or, th- or the provider using fear, shame tactics to force that child to go through different procedures. Right. But you got to meet them where they are. This is back to yeah. what's the root cause that goes, then again, why you call it holistic. And let's see what the patient can handle. And oftentimes, let's get them started with something like the Mayo Munchie, with the Mayo Brace, mm-hmm. because they're not ready yet even to work with a trained myofunctional therapist that's trained with a little one. They might not be Mm. ready for that intensity yet. Right. Give them some stepping stones. And I have run into the parents then getting very upset because, well, but they need that expansion right now. I've heard it. I've done my research. Okay. I, I see you and you're worried. And prior to starting the podcast, I was telling Rebecca, I'm like, okay, yep. thank you for allowing me to share um, my ultimate mission, which is to empower caregivers and patients. So I don't use very many statistics. There are so many awesome practitioners that are out there sharing that. And I love that that raises awareness and oftentimes we'll get parents to take that next step. But I also understand sometimes it can invoke shame and fear. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what my true calling is, is to help patients and caregivers get through that hurdle of shame and fear because it keeps us locked up. 
and understanding that with the holistic approach, I am going to have some conversations of ultimately trauma comes with a word with different thoughts with it, but we need to understand that trauma is just anything that our body can't handle at that time. If you've ever hit your knee against a coffee table (laughs) one day, be like, darn it. I need to move that coffee table. But another day, if you've had a bad morning because you didn't sleep well and you got up and kids are screaming at you and you're late for work and then you hit that table, it can hurt all day long. And then you're mad at yourself because you didn't move the coffee table. (laughs) Like, oh, it's the same thing. It's the same knee, but it's what your body couldn't handle that day because you had already reached that threshold. Right. It's just one more thing. And each kid has a different threshold. Each patient, all of us have a different threshold. And sometimes what happened to with a child's history, you need to first address some trauma. And I don't mean trauma, like the horrible things that you can see on TV. I mean, sometimes all those nights of poor sleep, it was just, it was a lot on the child being told Mm -hmm. you should be able to sleep and the child can't sleep. Mm-hmm. Let's first just let it go. Yeah. Let's let all all of what happened in the past go. Let's acknowledge the things like, okay, this provider wasn't helpful in our journey. Let's let them go. We can address it, get back to them, inform them when the time is right. But right now, just let it go and look to the future. Right. Start from here and go forward. Yeah. And so that's the other part of the holistic approach because getting mad isn't going to get you anywhere. It's going to keep you stuck and it's going to keep you in that shame because you're getting mad because you ultimately feel shame that you trusted somebody who really trusted them and it ended up not working. Right, right. And if we look really deep, sometimes we're like, oh, I kind of didn't feel so great about that provider. I kept going there and we Mm -hmm. need to be okay with that, that inner voice. And it's okay. Listen to the voice. And Mm -hmm. we've all, we've all ignored it. Yep. I, I was that mom. It took, it took my son having night tears at six months. I kept going to, you know, what was supposed to be best in our area, pediatric. I I love the fact that the pediatric, pediatric office you could call them at any time because there was like four providers now the first month he was there almost every week he had to be on um iv antibiotics after birth and so he had to be seen he was seen throughout that whole month Mm -hmm. and at the month check when he didn't gain any weight i had a bottle thrusted in my hand and told you and your child cannot leave until he drinks this entire bottle of formula. Oh. Yeah. And I kept going for another five months. Mm. I kept going even though during that first month prior to the formula bottle shoved in my hand, I was told that my worries of my son's heavy breathing was that you're a geriatric mom who worries too much. Go home and enjoy your child. Mm. I kept going. But until six months when he was having, he had his first night tear. I immediately called him. I need, I need to get in. So I called our office and I called another office that thankfully a colleague had talked about her in passing. She said, you know what? This pediatrician actually asks her patients if they brush their teeth. I'm like, oh, mm. well, that's a breath of fresh air. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I'm like, well, that's that's great. So I called. At the time, it was practically a startup. So I we got in first to our regular pediatrician. Becca, can you guess what he told us? Yeah. He'll grow out of it. Go home. You're worrying too much. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Any of those. Yeah. He'll grow out of it by four or five years old. He won't remember it. 
And when I said, well, but my husband and I do, he's like, well, just grab a beer. Oh, God. Okay. For those that don't know what a night tear is, uh, my experience is with a child, with an infant. It's different if as your child gets older. But either way, it's when the child is actually inconsolable. So the child, it's different than a, a nightmare or a dream because the child can sometimes, depending on a, a age, might get out of bed. They're, they can move. And if you try to comfort them, it makes it worse. And then they come out of it and not really understanding what's going on because now, now you're trying, now you're, now it is okay to hold them, but, they're but then they're disoriented because they don't know what just happened, but their body, like for my infant was just crying and screaming and heaving. Mm. And that's a lot of stress on, on a body and then feeling, yes, Oh, cause your body remembers that. Yes, it does. The brain Which, by the doesn't. way, is a great book. The body remembers. We'll put that link in there. Cause it's a great book. <laughs> <laughs> and you, as the parent, you're going to remember trying to console your child and not being able to console them. Mm hmm so we went to the other, to the new practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And within 10 seconds, she's like, what are you doing about his head shape? Cause he had started to have a little bit of um, head flattening because of his torticollis that he was getting mm -hmm. physical therapy for. She's like, oh, I think he's got, he's either got a lip tie or a tongue tie, maybe both, maybe. We started talking about low vitamin D levels, his probiotics, because he had been on the IV uh, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. We'd had trouble nursing. Now we went to Northwestern, which is the best hospital in my area. No conversation about how to help my baby's gut microbiome after mm -hmm. he'd been on IV antibiotics an hour after born. Just surprising. And I was a new mom. You could- yeah. I could We've be shamed. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I should have thought about this. I, I didn't think about it. And his life started to drastically change from small things that were done same day. Started him on the vitamin mm -hmm. D3 that day. I started him on the probiotics that day. Started bathing him in Epsom salt baths that day. Now he still had some night tears. We had some things that needed to be worked out. Um, so I just, I share that story to let any caregiver, any patient themselves, if, if you don't have children, um, that reminder that that little voice isn't always the easiest because you have to give up other stuff. I had to give mm -hmm. up the comfort of this practice. I had four doctors that I could call anytime. Mm -hmm. I had to give up the comfort that everybody else took their kids to and they could understand and give me pros and cons like, oh, you should go see this one for this question. Mm -hmm. And usually it's that comfort that's the hardest to give up. But on the other side of comfort is growth. Yep. yep. And that goes for and practitioners and parents. <laughs> I was, and I was about to say it, it also transcended from your personal life into your practice, which is why, um, and I'd like to talk about that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Your practice is very different. It's very unique, I should say. Uh, it's not just because of the airway focus and the holistic approach you take. What else makes it different? Well, I, as of last December, so December of 2023, I was finally able to close the doors on my private practice and solely focus on getting this approach to as many people as possible. So I, I had started a startup We've gotten through COVID. I'd had our second child right before COVID. Um, I should just say the pandemic, right? I hate saying that. <laughs> so I apologize. Right, right. I'm trying to be better about that. Um, and then I realized, wow, I'm putting so much into this, but I can only see so many people one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. And I need more of me to my kids who ultimately need the best of me every day. And I realized having my own kind of limited me because again, I could only see so many. Whereas mm -hmm. how can I get this to, to more caregivers? Because ultimately they're going to be the ones that change 
right? Because they're going to be asking. And how can I get to more providers that once they see it, but then sometimes they're like, I don't know what to do with it. And orthodontists, especially at that time, were like, I don't really want to do this at all. And we had a lot of general practitioners that were like, I've got to do this. Because a lot of times they had had it for themselves or most likely their own children. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm going to figure out a way that I can help other practices, especially holistic dental practices, that they get to see the kids. They have that no like trust factor. Mm -hmm. But so many general dentists, they, they're really good at what they do, right? And typically the training in orthodontics in school is so little. And then they're looking at spending so many weekends and investing so much into something that then they're, they're not very comfortable with, because mm -hmm. it's very different from the restorative needs of their patients. And they're left with this in between of like, I really need to do this, but I don't really feel comfortable. What do I do? And I would love to help them. And so I started being able to do that and start going in there. So then I can serve as someone that can actually initiate the orthodontic department if they need me to initiate that. They don't have that. Some mm -hmm. have a small orthodontic department where it's Invisalign. It could be that six month smiles, but growing it and taking that approach differently so that they can focus on like, oh, well, I already know some of this. And if I just shift the way I'm thinking about it, I can offer these benefits with it too. And then being there to talk with the patients mm -hmm. when they need me to, I can be there, you know, to ask questions. I've had uh, the doctors send pictures. Like I haven't seen this before what's going on. I'm like, oh, here, this, this is common. If one of the most common things, so parents, <laughs> listen, one of the most common problems when you have a patient going through expansion mm -hmm. is what they're eating and not getting out of their gums or their teeth mm -hmm. that can lead the patient either like them playing with the things in their mouth because they want to get it out, but they right. don't want to tell you because you might find out that they ate popcorn, <laughs> eating the popcorn, that shell up underneath the gums, but no mom, because they don't want to get in trouble. Right, right. <laughs> or, oh, I did eat all those Sour Patch Kids and now things are poking me. Oh, but I can't tell the doctor this. I can't tell my parents this. So I'm just gonna say, I don't know what happened. And then it leads to all these things. Well, this shouldn't have happened. Well, no, yeah, it, it shouldn't have happened, but they're doing things that they're not feeling comfortable with telling you. So right. you just have to, it's how you question them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what I get to do now. I get to work out of different offices and kind of help them as needed. I'm also working in an office where I, I do run, I'm, I'm the only orthodontist there. I'm not uh, helping another general practitioner there. I, I am transforming the department where they are permitting me to talk about myofunctional therapy with patients. Mm -hmm. It's brand new to this um, DSO. And I have so much pride in them that they, I am very thankful for this opportunity and very grateful for seeing DSOs kind of shifting gears. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm at. I'm really, I'm really grateful for it because I do know now I'm able to make a bigger impact. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. And you touched on this a little bit, but something we don't hear a lot of, how does myofunctional therapy work with orthodontics? I mean, we've talked about it from the dental side, but not you know, from the orthodontic side. Well, it helps get to that root cause. Now, I love my myofunctional therapist, and I will say sometimes I think the burden that's put on them is way too heavy because the four goals of myofunctional therapy, lips together, tongue up, proper swallowing, and nasal breathing. That's a lot to put on one provider. <laughs> so those are the goals. And I remind the patients that your myofunctional therapist is kind of the quarterback for the team to meet all four goals. I'm like, that therapist is going to help you and is going to give you exercises to support those. But if there's barriers to that, 
that exercises are not gonna be able to help with, that is on you. So there's going to be a need for collaboration outside of just ortho and myofunctional therapy. Because if they can't breathe through their nose, that therapist can't get them nasal breathing. Right, right. Right, mm-hmm. so sometimes I feel like those those four goals should be the four goals of all like healthcare. <laughs> And we understand that Mayo is the one that can help with the with integration. Everybody. With and we're, and yes. we're back to that again, right? You're taking this holistic approach where it's not just this orthodontist on an island mm-hmm. and the pediatrician on this island. We're all on the same island together Yes, with the myofunctional therapist and the dentist and whoever else we need. Because I've had patients, well, I went through Mayo. I'm like, well, but what what did you do to really make sure that you can nasal breathe if you still have all those glade plugins <laughs> and yep. you're you're never opening up the doors in in your house what are you doing to support that nasal breathing i mean there are so mm-hmm. many things that go into it and if you have that obstruction but you don't want to see the ENT again just because you went through myofunctional therapy doesn't mean that that therapist can get you to all four goals if you right. don't again, get to the root cause of why. Right. Again, because my functional therapist isn't going, well, some uh, might do revisions on oral restrictions if needed. Right. Um, so there's, it's not this one and done. It's not just my functional therapy and orthodontics. Mm. I do tell my patients that if they can only choose one to first start with my functional therapy. Okay. And the reason is because it gets them more empowered Mm -hmm. because they can actually feel what is a struggle for them. They can see what they should Mm -hmm. be doing, right? The therapist can show them how to do the lingual palatal section where they put the tongue up to the roof of the mouth. It's also called Mm -hmm. the cave. And if they're struggling, they can, they can see it. The reason Also for this, because when I start to move the jaws, when I start to widen them, they see what I can do. And they're not understanding that maintaining that is on them. Mm -hmm. They're relying on an appliance and a force system that I can put in that I'm trained to do. And it's great. I love the fact that we are able to do this. I mean, my job is incredible. I can move teeth and jaws yeah and you don't have to be and change under, lives yes you don't have to be hospitalized unless you're obviously needing orthopedic surgery but we can do these things mm-hmm. but again we are relying on externals if you can first see what you can do you're going to be more empowered to then maintain what i can help facilitate your body to do with the expanders braces etc yeah well, and this seems like a good time to, to bring this up because you have this video, which I will put in um, the show notes for people about shooting yourself. And, and just, I know people might think I just said something else, but it's, you know, what you should have done or what others think you should do. So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying shooting. Um, you know, how do we as parents, and I, and I would, and I would think, it would apply to providers as well, but I'm just going to look at it from a parent's perspective. How do we shift away from this whole shooting thing and start to follow our intuitions? Trust yourselves. There, there are a few reminders sometimes that we, we know more than what we give ourselves credit. We know so much about our child. And I say that, it, and I understand there are so many different ways to be a parent, so many ways, and you know your child. And so I honor that. And listeners, I understand that your situation might be different than mine. I share with you that I, I gave birth to my son, but that doesn't make me any more in touch with my son than a parent that adopted a child from halfway across the world. Right. They're still you. You know your child. Mm -hmm. You also know yourself. Mm -hmm. 
And the input that you have is needed and should be asked for. You have gone through the scientific method on your child without knowing it. There's six things for the scientific yeah. method. You ask a question about what you're observing. You do your background research. You construct a hypothesis. You experiment that hypothesis. You analyze the data and then you communicate it. You've done that because no person comes with the set. You might've read these great books that are out there that say your child should go and take a nap from 11 to this time. And then you get them up and you do all this and you get them back in bed, but we're not robots. And then you've decided, okay, well, we got this going on and this going on. And then you start to see, well, if I put my child to bed earlier than 11, the child might lay there for a while. If you're co-sleeping, might play with you for a little while and then go to sleep. But if you wait till 12, they came overly tired. You've done this since you tried to get them to sleep mm -hmm. <laughs> from, right. from the start. And so every have... child's different too, because I have two, what I did for one. The second one just kind of, it, it's almost as if she looks at you like, okay, no, because she knows, <laughs> she's like, I'm not doing it that way. Every child is different, so you have to adjust. Exactly. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Game on, mom. Oh, yeah. Oh, she was. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to test you out because you thought this was going to be easier. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so you've done little experiments. You've mm -hmm. done that with food. Mm -hmm. Okay. You may not have known it. You may not have said, okay, I'm just going to think, mm, should I take away all gluten? But you've probably done like, oh, I gave them ice cream right before bed last night. And that didn't, that didn't seem to work out so well. So maybe if I move the ice cream actually to this time and we just don't have midnight, we don't have nighttime snacks. Let's see how that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've done mm -hmm. this so often. You've tested so many things without knowing it. That if your provider's not asking for your input, then you may want to find a provider or ask them, can I tell you? Because again, mm -hmm. that provider might be used to patients not wanting to share information. That's Yesterday I point. had a patient that it was so nice. She easily shared her whole sleep history with me, her medication list, everything. I'm like, thank you. Thank you for trusting me without, you hadn't even met me yet. And you wrote all of that down. And I want to honor you because it's not, it's not easy to share all that with someone that you don't know. That's true. And there are many providers out there that don't get all the list of medications. I love talking to optometrists because the work I do can really help positively impact vision. But optometrists are often treated the same way as dentists, <laughs> often treated the same way as chiropractors. Like, oh, well, why does that doctor need to know that information? Mm -hmm. But it's and all connected. Yes. Connected. <laughs> and you're... Physician's not going to call us and tell us. If you don't tell us, we we won't know what you're on. So the shooting yourself, it is one of my most proud things to share because it empowers you when you start doing what you know is right. And at first you might not be fully confident. You might be like, eh, I think it's right. But then take a minute. You don't have to. You don't have to do it right now. Most things we feel like once we get scared, we hear we got to take action right now. <laughs> Most things you don't have to, right? If your kid's choking, you take action right then. But right. there's not any doubt of like, oh, you should help your child when they're choking. Right, right. But if your child, if you're looking at your child's teeth and you're like, man, they are really crooked. I just, I don't know yet. Do some more research. Mm -hmm. Feel some things out, go back, listen to some more calf podcasts, <laughs> look at their resources. They've got lots of great mm -hmm. books on there. Do your research and then you'll find what resonates with you and yeah. follow that. I think that's brilliant. And it's usually I ask my guests at the end of a, an episode, I, I turn the floor back over for the final word and it was actually a really good final word, but is there more <laughs> that you could add to that for the final word? Well. This might seem a little off topic, but it really goes back to everything. 
Okay. Listeners, viewers, I know for the most part, I don't know you. But I truly believe in every single one of you. And you are enough. You are enough of a parent. You are enough of a daughter, son, mother, father, coworker, educator, whatever is how you serve people. Because I don't want to say your job because it's all how we serve. You are enough and you are so deserving to feel good every day. So if I can be of help, I, I limit my one-on-one -on -one time with colleagues and one-on-one -on -one time with caregivers because I, like I said, I've chosen to spend as much time as I can with my kids, but also making it a big impact. Mm -hmm. But let me know, reach out. And I would, I would love to support you and what you're doing. Because if you're listening to this podcast, then you're on such a great journey. And you, you are deserving, you are enough. And so is your child. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything you shared with us today. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.